Hello boys and girls, Greg from the Scary Spirits Podcast here to make you another cocktail. Today's featured cocktail is the Black Fog Cocktail. We're going to take our glass, our fancy tilted glass. To that, we're going to take some Guinness. nitrogen. We're going to slowly pour our Guinness into our glass. Slowly. Next, we're going to take some raspberry liqueur. and one or two splashes. Splash, 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 splash. <laughs> then we slightly swirl to mix. Tastes a lot like Guinness. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy the podcast. See ya. When it comes to horror films, can less really be more? In this week's episode of the Scary Spirits podcast, The Fog, John Carpenter challenges us to use our imagination. And honestly, I think it works. There isn't a lot of blood, gore, or graphic violence in this one, at least not on film, but you'd be surprised where your mind goes. Or maybe I've just watched way too many horror films, because I had no trouble filling in the blanks here. With the right imagination, you really can do a lot, with a little. Cheers! Welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast. Please be advised that the presenters may use adult language and or discuss adult situations. This podcast is not intended for younger listeners or those that may be easily offended. So, if you're ready, let's go. Hi, I'm Greg. Hey, I'm Karen. And welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast, the podcast that combines the two very different but highly compatible worlds of scary films and alcoholic spirits. What could possibly go wrong? How are you, Karen? I'm feeling really good. How are you, Greg? Wow. Are you now? Feeling better? The plague is all gone and has totally left your body? Well, not totally, but pretty much. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I'm feeling pretty good, too. Excellent. Is that because we picked one of your favorite movies? It don't hurt, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Speaking of which, Karen, what is today's film? I believe it was your choice. It was my choice. And this week I have chosen the 1980 film, The Fog. John Carpenter's The Fog from 1980. Any reason you chose this film, Karen? The reason I chose it, Greg, is because on the day that this podcast comes out was the day that it was released in 1980. Way back in 1980, Karen. Yep. You remember 1980? I'm sure I've asked you this before. And I'm sure I've answered that I do. <laughs> good good year for you, Karen. Getting there. And I think I've said, yeah, it was very good for me. Yes, so. <laughs> because you were advanced. <laughs> I was advanced for my age. Yes, you were. Because I hung around all the older kids, Karen. Yeah, that never leads to trouble. Even older than you. <laughs> Some of them. Is that even possible? Yeah, actually most of them. <laughs> all right, so this year would be the 
43rd. Yeah. 43. Yeah. Yeah. 43 years ago. My, how time flies. That makes it sound even worse that it was a good year for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing things 43 years ago. I should not have been doing. <laughs> That's for sure. Oh, well. Live and learn. It's okay. You still do things you shouldn't do. Don't let it get you down. I do. Do we have a cocktail for this film, Karen? We do. And what might that be? It's called The Black Fog. The Black Fog. Which if I had watched the movie beforehand, I wouldn't have chosen, but hey. would called The White Fog or something. You yes. would find something called The White Fog. or The Fluorescent Fog. The Glowing Fog. The Glowing Fog. Yes. The green fog. But unfortunately, (laughs) we're stuck with the black fog, which isn't necessarily bad. How would we make this concoction, Karen? It sounds difficult. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you're going to take a can of Guinness, pour it in a tilted glass, and then add a splash of raspberry liqueur. A splash. Yeah. What's a splash, Greg? I don't know, Karen. What is a splash? Well, measured out in drops using a precise millimeter dropper, a dash is about 10 single drops. Measured out in teaspoons, a dash would be one fifth teaspoon, which is hard to measure because teaspoons are quarter and eighth. So somewhere between those two. I think I put in a little more than that. Well, it said one or two dashes. So two dashes would be two fifths of a teaspoon, which is almost half a teaspoon, right? Yeah, fuck that's it. fuck it. Might as well say half a teaspoon. Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> We've learned something already, Karen. I know this one's going to be killer. Should we give our listeners time to make their own, Karen? Listeners, listen to you. <laughs> Woo, thinking we have more than one, but yes, absolutely. Let's give them our, time. To- our friends and listeners <laughs> run off and make this complicated one. Hold on. And we're back. Yes, we are. Wasn't it cool the way the nitrogen sounded when you popped the top on that Guinness can, Karen? It is pretty neat. And and friends and listeners. (laughs) There's like a little nitrogen cartridge in there that you can tell. Yeah, you can feel it. it. When it pops, it knows that it's opened and it releases nitrogen. Ooh. Yeah, I thought probably back in back in 1980, we took a can apart to figure out what the hell it was. I don't think they had the cans in 1980. I think that was much later. I don't think you could get them here, get Guinness here, period, in 1980, for that matter. Probably not. That was much later, I think. Or late 80s, early 90s, I would say, when we had we had to find out what is that in there. <laughs> Especially after drinking a couple. Well, you had to empty the can, too. You know, had to drink it I mean, before you, you well, could you take it Well, you had to. <laughs> All right, Karen, might you have a brief synopsis of this film, The Fog from 1980? I do. Go on. Tell me a story. Strange things begin to occur as a tiny California coastal town prepares to commemorate its centenary. Inanimate objects spring eerily to life. Reverend Malone stumbles upon a dark secret about the town's founding. Radio announcer Stevie witnesses a mystical fire, and hitchhiker Elizabeth discovers the mutilated corpse of a fisherman. Then a mysterious iridescent fog descends upon the village, and more people start to die. Very inaccurate. (laughs) It's terrible. (laughs) Well, there's a couple things in there that are true. Watching this film, Karen, I could not help but be reminded of uh, the facts you told us all about the fog in California and the redwoods and all that shit, Karen. No, I have Remember more that? fog facts later. Oh, good. <laughs> I know you can't wait. I know. Awesome. I'd do it now, but I don't want to spoil the excitement. No, no, no. Don't spoil it. Had you seen this film before, Karen? I had not. 
I have. Several times. How many times would you think? Several. <laughs> Three? Yeah, maybe. Hey. I mean. Less than 10? I have the DVD, Karen. You have a lot of DVDs, a, though, and you don't play them. So These special edition DVDs. Is that where you watched it? And I had John Carpenter sign it when I met Ooh. him once. I did watch it. I watched my DVD, Karen. And to make things even more interesting, I watched with the commentary from John Carpenter and Deborah Hill turned on. Oh. So I missed a ton of dialogue, Karen, just so you know. So we'll see how this goes. There were subtitles. You know, it was closed caption so i could read what the people were saying while john carpenter was talking but it's hard to listen and read at the same time <laughs> so well, well now see. my fog facts don't seem very important anymore where did you watch it did you say amazon, amazon i watched it Prime. on amazon yeah all right did anything pop up on your screen before it came on yes rated r yes for violence yes frightening scenes yes alcohol use Yes. Smoking. Yes. And sexual contact. Content. <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> now, if there was sexual contact, <laughs> now that that's would what be my um, sexual content. <laughs> yes. So the film starts and there's words to read, correct, Karen? Yes. I believe it says, Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? Question mark. Edgar Allan Poe. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's. I guess. I can't trust my talk to text at this point, so that seems yeah. close enough to me. Then we have a scene with Mis Mr. Machen is his name, Karen. <laughs> no, I did not know that. Played by John Hausman, correct? Telling the ghost story to a bunch of kids on... Um, April 20th. It's all right. It's almost midnight, right? It's almost April 21st, right? Yes. He says he has just enough time to tell one more story before midnight. Yes. Tells him the story about a ship called the Elizabeth Dane, I believe, Karen, <laughs> that wrecked on a, a rocky shore there called Spivey Point. Apparently, the ship was following a campfire on the shore, and it led them to their demise. Is that correct, Karen? Yes, and they are all sitting around a campfire yes. at this moment. And then he says that, you know, they say that when the fog returns to Antonio Bay, which is the town, that the men will rise up and search for the campfire from the depths of the ocean. Yes, so he says they crashed and everything went down. Everybody on board met their doom. Yep. And he says they'll come back. There you go. And then boom, it's April 21st. Well, yeah, it's 100 midnight. years since the accident. Yes. And we have credits, some credits. They talked about the long, drawn out credits on the commentary. Because during the credits, we have scenes of other things like. You know, we could cut to a church, right? We see winds, wind blowing. We see that they're on the shore of the ocean. So you see they're next to the ocean. Yeah. And then we see a man listening to a radio working in the church. Did you know that was John Carpenter? I did not. That was John Carpenter, the director. The man that, working in the church. Yes. And he said this was the last film he ever acted in where he had lines. He 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 acted in his later films either as like bodies or helicopter pilots or something, just or you know just cameos, filling scenes. But because he said he was scared to death of doing this scene with Hal Holbrook, <laughs> and he said he sucked. So he, he said he'd never do it again. I don't think he sucked. But he's basically like the night cleaning person or whatever right yeah or like the fixer upper guy you know the handyman that's what yeah. he looked like but he leaves well he tells the priest he's all done and the priest tells him to come back at four tomorrow the priest is drinking wine and then well i guess john carpenter asks am i gonna get paid 
Mm -hmm. And he says, well, why don't you come back at six tomorrow instead of four? (laughs) So basically, no, they are listening to the radio. So I don't know if there's only one radio station that these people can get on their radio because everybody listens to this one radio station. Yeah, station KAB, right? Yep. So John Carpenter leaves and a, a brick falls from the wall of the church, right? Piece yeah, of rock. He, he forgot his radio. The priest grabs the radio and tries to run after him, and tell him he forgot the radio. And then the things start to shake and there's some minor explosion and a rock falls out of the wall. <laughs> Revealing what appears to be an old book, Karen, right? Yes. And the radio station plays jazz music. And he pulls the priest, pulls the book out, and it says it's the journal of Father Patrick Malone, who I guess was his grandfather. He has the same name. So he's like a Patrick Malone, the third or whatever, right? Yeah. So this can't be a Catholic church. Okay. Because priests aren't supposed to marry and have children. True. But it's from 1880. It is from 1880. And he starts reading from the journal, correct? Well, I think there's an inscription in the beginning first, right? That says, April 30, midnight till one belongs to the dead. Good Lord, deliver us. Yes. You know what that's a reference to, Karen? No. Valpurgis Noct. No. Which is April 30th, right? I think so. Yep. Then we have kind of a mon. Do we have a montage here around the town or something? I don't know. I have that weird. There's a woman on the radio that says it's their birthday and they're 100 years old today, the yes. bay. But and believe- she says the skies are clear and she's going to stay another hour just to make sure that the weatherman's right. Because yep. the weatherman says it's going to rain. So I guess there was a, a montage of the town. And at one point, we eventually are in a police station, and we hear that there's been a um, a boat run aground or something, the Lady Bell Pacific, and they're going to send a tow out. I didn't see that. Yeah, it's on the like the police radio or something. Then we're in a store, and a man is sweeping up. Yeah, all the pay phones outside start ringing. Did you notice that? And then they all, all the coins start jingling and falling to the bottom, which I was like, that's a kid's dream to go. Cause remember you would always check to see if there was money in the payphone when you were a kid, but yeah, there's a man cleaning up. I thought it was a supermarket, but it kind of looks like maybe a seven 11 type place. And he's, he is, he's sweeping and he gets thirsty. So he takes an orange juice off the <laughs> shelf, drinks some of it and puts it back, which is gross. <laughs> okay. As you do. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he was really thirsty, but and things begin to shake. Yes. In the store. And glass shatters. And we cut to a gas station, an old timey gas station, and the lights come on and the gas gas pump hose comes out of the pump Hold. and starts pumping gasoline and the car lift turns on and all the car headlights turn on. It's like um Maximum overdrive for a minute. (laughs) Yes, it is. All the machines are coming to life. And we cut to a house. And who we learn later is Sandy. And her TV comes on and like a chair flies across the room. And we see a full moon, Karen. And a truck driving down the road. Yeah. And then Stevie, who is the woman on the radio, says she's going to play music all through the witching hour. Because she's on the radio, he's listening to it in the car. And I was like, I thought the witching hour was three to four, but I looked it up and some people say it's midnight to one. Mm-hmm. She and says that phrase often. They did make a note in the commentary that they filmed this in 30 days from full moon to full moon. Oh, okay. So they said there's lots of full moon shots in it. <laughs> but the truck driver picks up a hitchhiker, correct? He does. The lovely Elizabeth. Played I by called Jamie her, Lee Curtis. I called her Jamie Lee Curtis the whole time. <laughs> her name's Elizabeth. She gets in the truck. He's drinking beer. A Budweiser. Yep. They share a can of Budweiser. 
Elizabeth asks him, are you weird? And he says, yes, I am. <laughs> and she seems pleased at that. Well, first she says she's never, this is her first time hitchhiking and asks if he's weird. And he said, yes. And she says, good. Cause the last guy that I took a ride from was way too normal. And then he says, I thought you'd never hitchhiked. <laughs> and then she admits it's her 13th ride. So weird and unlucky. And the driver's name is Nick. Yes. And immediately after he says that, all the windows bust out of the car. Yep. Glass shatters. And we cut to Stevie, Stevie Wayne, broadcasting from the lighthouse. Dan, the weatherman, calls her. Dan has a crush on Stevie. Yes. And he tells her about a fog bank he is seeing on the radar. But, you know, you can't see fog banks on radar, just so you know, Karen. Okay. And also there's news of a, another boat out there, the seagrass, who, you know, he sees the boat, right, on the radar or some shit? He does see the boat. He calls it a trawler, which I had to look up because I didn't know what a trawler was. Yeah. But some fishing boats are called trawlers because they use a trawl net to catch fish. So mm -hmm. the fish, such as cod and haddock, caught by these boats feed on the bottom of the ocean. So I guess they're pulling the net along the bottom of the ocean, trawling yeah. it. Yeah. We cut to the men on the seagrass, and it seems to me they're just out to drink. They're just That's... out on the boat to have a drink to me. Yeah, they don't seem to be doing anything. Uh, except... No, I don't see them pulling up any nets. It's not like deadliest catch or anything, right, Karen? <laughs> no. <laughs> she does say, because everyone listens to her on the radio, she mm -hmm. gives them a special message that watch out for the fog. Yep. So the fog rolls in, Karen, to the seagrass, and we see lights in the fog as well. Fog begins to envelop the ship, and a huge ship goes by them in the fog, Karen. Then we see silhouettes of seamen or sailors. Yeah, the ship that is going by them is a little hagged. You know, it doesn't quite yes. look new and pristine for sure looks like a good so ghost what are you going to call these guys i was i didn't know whether to call them zombies i or... call them sailors okay sailors that's All what right. i call them john carpenter throughout the commentary calls them ghosts oh ghosts okay but i call them sailors because sailor ghosts yeah i called them zombies because it seemed like they came back from the dead but whatever but they kill the man on the ship with hooks and swords. Hooks and swords. And one of them, I guess the last dude, they knife his eyes out, right? So there are two up on deck and the third one goes to try to start the boat and get out of there. Because at first they're saying... Well, he doesn't know they're all the other two are dead either. Right. They're cra She's crazy. There's no fog out here. I don't see any fog. And they say that a couple times. And then all of a sudden they're enclosed in fog. So two of them are on deck and the third one goes down to move cuz they're in the fog. I don't So the two up on deck get killed first and then they go down to where the guy is trying to start the boat and they get him too. And apparently they the fog makes the engine wet or something. What didn't make sense. I don't know what they were saying cuz the boat seems like it would be pretty impervious to wetness, <laughs> but I don't know. But yeah, they stab him in the eyeballs. And we cut back to the lighthouse and Stevie lights a Marlboro. And the weatherman calls again and asks Stevie out to dinner. Stevie he, looks out the window and see lights on the horizon in the fog. She says too, well, he calls her and says, you were wrong. The fog bank probably missed the ship because it was going... West. west and she says oh my gauges must be wrong because my gauges say the wind is blowing east so that's a little confusing but mm -hmm. she doesn't accept his dinner invitation no but she does think she sees something in the distance like you said but and it disappears cut, and we cut to elizabeth and nick in bed karen i think they've had sexual relations Sex, sexual contact. <laughs> yes, I do believe there's your sexual contact right there. And then they introduce each other because, of course, they haven't done that yet. <laughs> no, she's an artist. 
Yeah, and they're looking at her drawings. And as they're doing this, there's a knock at the door. A pounding, kind of. Not just a knock. An insistent knock, I guess. Uh, and we see a silhouette in the door, right? The door's kind of like an opaque glass, and we see a silhouette, right? Yes. But it's surrounded by fog now out there. So Nick goes to answer the door. Just as he's about to, the clock strikes 1 a.m. and the glass breaks on the clock face. And there's nobody there when he opens the door. Right? Does he open the door? He yeah, does. he does. Yeah. Okay. That also rings the doorbell. Whoever's out there. Oh, okay. And we cut to the next day and we see who we learn is Andy out on the beach, which is with his fishing pole, Karen. Yep. And I will say, I like the accuracy here because I don't know where they film this, probably in California, but running on the beach with his fishing pole, the kids <laughs> in a winter coat, because yes. it's cold on the beaches in Northern <laughs> California. Everybody who comes to visit always ends up buying a sweatshirt and it's very cold and windy. Point Reyes or Point Race. Point Reyes. Point Reyes. Point yeah, it's Point Reyes. That's where that... it was filmed. The outdoor, these kind these outdoor scenes were. Oh, well, that's interesting because Point Reyes, California gets 200 foggy days per year. It's the foggiest place in California. They mentioned that in the commentary. They learned that afterwards. <laughs> they can stick and the fog can stick around for weeks, especially during the summer months. <laughs> so you want to know why is there fog in California? Yeah, Karen, sure. <laughs> I'll bite. Why is there fog in California? I was starting to come up, I was trying to come up with a reason, but now I'll just say, why, Karen? Tell us. <laughs> the combination of a cool, moist layer of air from the Pacific close to the surface. Clear skies above and light winds results in exceptionally thick fog on many nights from late October through February. I've actually been to Point Reyes. I've seen that lighthouse. There's a lot of steps to go down. I think we see her do that, but I, I've been there. It's a good uh, whale watching site, and there's sea lions there too. Yeah, I can't. Um, I might mention it later, but yeah, I, they do say how many steps there are, and I might mention it later. <laughs> it's a long walk down, and the only way back up is to walk all the way back up. Thank goodness I was younger when I attempted that. So Andy is uh, climbing on rocks and shit, and he sees a gold coin flashing in the sun. Yeah, of course, the tide is coming in and out, and he goes to grab it, and the tide comes in, washes it away, and what is left in its place is a piece of driftwood, Karen, or wood. It looks like a plank to me. Yep. Andy takes it home and shows his mom, Stevie, who's the owner of the radio station, owner and DJ, apparently. And we see that it has the word Dane engraved in it. Yeah, and he goes in and wakes up his mom because obviously she works the later shift, six to one. I think, is she the only DJ? She is. So it's only on air from six to one. Yeah. Prior to that, they play those tapes or whatever we hear. Oh, later. okay. I I couldn't figure that out. I didn't know enough to know that, <laughs> but yes. But she's a little annoyed that he woke her up because that's her, you know, her sleeping time. And we're on the pier and we see Nick and Elizabeth. Apparently Nick's friends never came back. They're on the seagrass, right? He's worried yes. about them. And apparently this pier was used in the birds. And a lot of these locations apparently was used by Alfred Hitchcock in the birds. They kept talking about it on the commentary. But basically, they're going to get a boat to go out there and they're going to try to find the seagrass, right? It seems like a needle in a haystack thing, but okay. I guess maybe with radar, you could see where it might be. But they called the Coast Guard, right? Have they at this point or not yet? Not yet. Okay. But Elizabeth says she's going to stay with Nick and help him look. And then we switch to town. Kathy and Nancy getting ready for the centennial, Karen. In their 1976 Ford LTD Country Squire station wagon. With the wood panels on the side. Yes. Classic. 
That's a big car. It is. It is the largest station wagon Ford made at the time. Oh, I didn't know that, but it's a it's a boat. <laughs> Any idea what that car went for brand new, Karen, in 1976? 1976? $5,000. I'm giving that to you. Really? <laughs> $5,523. I might have won on the price is right, but hard to say. All right. You want to guess what that car goes for now? That's hard. Average. Because there are probably people who want that car. I was surprised. You know, I thought it, it would be a, a lot less than what it is. 15000 You're a little high, Karen. <laughs> I always am. <laughs> well, no, unless you're talking the the high retail, you're you're right on, pretty much. Well, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. High you... retail is fifteen thousand nine hundred. I don't know. I mean, I get it's a classic, but I, it's not a very attractive car. <laughs> no. So we're in town, and they're getting ready to celebrate the hundred year anniversary, and. I called her Mrs. Williams. What's her name? Kathy. Kathy is with her assistant, Sandy. Yes. And she seems like a kind of tough boss, you know, but they have. Apparently a kind... she's a real estate agent is what oh, John okay. Carpenter and they were I saying. I couldn't figure out why she was in charge of all this. I called her the party planner because yes. she's very in charge and everything has to be just so. Now <laughs> we switch to classical music on the radio. And. DV in the car full of stuff. I think it's a Volkswagen. Is it a Volkswagen? It is, Karen. It's a 1973 Volkswagen Type 181. Convertible. Four-door convertible, Karen. Also known as The Thing here oh, in really? the States. Yeah. It's a VW thing. I vaguely remember that. Any idea what one of those went for brand new, Karen? A they weren't very common around here. Volkswagen though. Type 181. I want one. <laughs> Go on. Thirty two hundred. Little high, Karen. Just a little I was gonna high. say I was gonna say twenty eight hundred. Oh gotta... you should have. <laughs> you still would have been a little high, but oh. only fifty dollars. Oh, I would have went over though. Yeah, twenty seven fifty, brand new. And there were no options, Karen. There were no options to add or subtract. It was twenty seven fifty. And it was all four doors and all convertibles. Yes. Were they all yellow? Because they all seem to be yellow when they're in the movies. No, this one is pumpkin orange, which is the most oh. popular color. Is that the one but you want? I came in other ones. Sure. Any idea what that car goes for now, Karen? A 1973 Volkswagen Type 181 four door convertible thing? 24000 It's pretty good. Average retail price twenty six thousand six hundred. That's not bad. That's I, you know. You want to guess the high retail? What would make it if there were no options and they're all the same? So the high retail would just got to be, be like mint, pristine condition. Yep. Yeah, and a I'm low mileage. You know, forty thousand. Forty four. That's pretty good. Mm. I'm doing pretty it. well today. Yeah, you're killing it. But she's driving the car and the radio is giving info about the seagrass. And she says, if seen, notify the Coast Guard. She's saying that. Yes. No, she's listening to a report that the seagrass has not responded to radio communication. So she's listening to the Coast Guard on the radio. Okay. So somehow it cut into the classical music that she was listening to. Or she switched the channel and I didn't notice it. Yeah, but I guess it, maybe in coastal towns... Where people, you know, their business is fishing. Maybe the Coast Guard has a station and informs people of different things, which would make sense. So if anyone spots it, call the Coast Guard. And we cut to Nick and Elizabeth out in a boat now, and they're looking for the seagrass, and they see it with binoculars. And we cut back to Kathy and Sandy driving. And we cut back well, to the seagrass. Wait, but we, we find out that she didn't sleep last night. Because she's married to Al, who went out on the boat and didn't come back. Correct. Yeah. That and was one she part called I missed until later. Yeah. She called the Coast Guard and they said not to worry. 
And she said her dog was barking from midnight till six this morning. And then we go back to Nick and Elizabeth getting on the boats. Yep. They're on the seagrass. Oh, this is where they say there's water in the generator. But there is none on the deck. Right. And everything else is dry. We cut back to Kathy and Sandy arriving at the church. Yes. And I made a note here that Kathy tells Sandy, your yes, ma'ams sound a lot like screw you. (laughs) (laughs) So Kathy says the next, her next project is going to be restoration of the cemetery. And she's complaining that people don't want to help. And, but yes, her assistant. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But they're there to see Father Malone. And we should say that Kathy is played by Janet Lee. Yes. Who is Jamie Lee Curtis's mother in real life. Yes. And she looks amazing. Yeah, she does in the film. She does. She's very pretty. They go into the church, right? They're looking for the father. And Father Malone comes out of the shadows and startles Kathy. And I guess it's like a jump scare kind of thing, right? Yeah. And he tells him he has to show him something, and he shows him the journal and begins reading from it, right? Yes. This is where we get our backstory. And he's reading one passage. Met Blake for the first time. Rich man with a cursed disease. Looking to improve things for himself and the colony. I have 12-9. Is that the date? Yes. Okay. Have anything more to say about the journal so right now no because then we're back on the boat yeah we're back on the boat there's a lot of going back and forth in this Mm -hmm. movie there is checking out the seagrass all the gauges with glass that is shattered The, the thermometer is broken and it's at a very cold temperature i didn't make a note of what it was but but they say every, you know, all the glass is broken, like our windows in our the truck when they were driving. Mm-hmm. They relate it to that. And then we cut back to the priest reading Church. the journal. Yeah. And apparently the this uh, Blake wants to move the colony to just north of Antonio Bay. And the priest writes that he doesn't like a leper colony only a mile away. But the Blake has purchased a clipper ship called the Elizabeth Dane to bring the colony to the new place. But whoever's writing the journal, which is this guy's grandfather, doesn't want a leper colony only a mile away from where they are. Then back to the ship <laughs> where Elizabeth says they drink a lot of beer. Yeah, so Nick tastes it and it's salt water in the can of beer. So everything seems like the ship has been underwater. Except everything is dry. <laughs> right. Yeah. And Correct. Nick says the boat was clean two nights ago because he was on it. And now it looks like, and he says she's been turned over in the water. So I wanted to know why are boats referred to as she? She? Do you, do you know? I don't, Karen. I've heard. I. Well, there's a couple different <laughs> reasons. So one is in Latin, ship is not novice which is feminine word. So they just do it because of that. Or a feminine name is always selected with the idea of safety and protection and that the sea will mother and protect the vessel on its journeys just as the mother watches over her children. Ships are frequently or even usually female, but not always. In particular, in the Second World War, the German battleship Bismarck and another ship built to the same specifications were regarded as being so magnificent that they were described using male terms. <laughs> mm. It's not just boats either. It's um, cars, and cars, yeah. airplanes, everything. You know, the gay. Maybe it's because they want protection. So if you name it, the sea will the sea will mother and protect the vessel on its journey just as a mother watches over her children. So I don't know. I just I'd heard that all the time, never really looked into why. Cut back to the church. It's 420, what he's reading. Yes, from 12 to 1. The six of us planned the death of the men. Yes, Blake and his comrades. That was probably the most telling part of the whole movie. You know, I thought that was pretty intense. 
where they read that six people got together and planned to kill these people. Mm -hmm. Because at the time, before we got to this part, I was kind of wondering what's what's going on? Why are these people doing this? What, you know, is it just random that these ghost sailors are just coming around? Why wait a hundred years? What's the significance of the date? Like none of it was making any sense until this moment in the movie. And apparently there's gold on the ship too. And I guess he's a rich man. Yes. The father plans to use it to build a new church. He says, yeah, and they'll get their settlement to become a township with the money. And they won't have those nasty lepers just a mile away. <laughs> I just thought six men got together from midnight to one and planned the death of Blake and his comrades. Dun, dun, dun. That was a mistake. Never get together from 12 to <laughs> one and plan the murders of someone and their comrades. Just a little tip, a little bit of advice. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome, because you might need that <laughs> advice. Cut back to the seagrass. And Nick and Elizabeth are sitting there talking, and Elizabeth says she's always had bad luck. And They're waiting for the Coast Guard. That's why they're sitting there. Yeah. And she's, she apologizes, because she says ever since he picked her up, there's been terrible things happening. Nick tells her a story about his dad when he was out fishing, once finding a boat. Yes. And the whole time they're doing this, the light is swaying back and forth. So Nick goes in and out of darkness. It's pretty cool. But his his father said he found a gold coin, like minted in Spain or something. And he took it from the boat. And when he got home, he went to give it to Nick. But it was gone. It was no longer in his pocket. Just then the locker opens, Karen, and things fall out. So we have a little startle scare. And then a body falls on Elizabeth from yeah, behind it looked like, her. Looked like a man in a mask. It was a quick shot, but it didn't look. Was it the? It must have been the guy with his eyes. The guy who was below deck. Go back to the church. Journal entry four twenty one. Blake followed our false fire on the shore, and his ship broke against the rocks, aided by a fog that had rolled in, just by coincidence, right? Yes. And they will recover the gold the next day. The father says that the celebration tonight is a travesty. It's honoring murderers. They're centennial. So has he known this? No, he just knows this since he found the book. Correct. Okay. And the false light. So normally there would have been the lighthouse, but they turned off the lighthouse and put a campfire in so that it took him to well, the rocks. Is that what they're saying? Or why would he follow the light? The false I'm not light sure there were called. lighthouses, right? I know, and, but they called it fall the false light. So why yeah, would they so they put the campfire in a place where unless it, they it told would lead him, them to the rocks. But had they said we'll light a campfire yeah. to get okay. I didn't quite get that. I'm sure. And we cut back to Stevie and her Volkswagen. This is where she's going up to the lighthouse. Yep. Because she's she listening arrives to at the lighthouse and begins to go down the steps while she's listening to the tapes. The tapes are possible promos for the radio station. And I wrote this is a nice shot of her walking down the steps to the lighthouse. She gets there and she walks in the lighthouse and then she goes up a spiral staircase, which John Carpenter says they found and are the steps from 20,000 leagues under the sea. Oh, because they're on a set now. When she walks in, they're on a set. So she's carrying that Dane piece of wood, right? Mm hmm. And she steps it down on a box of tapes. Back at the church, I guess the father explains that he found the journal on the wall and they all put it together about the same time that things started going crazy in the town. Mm hmm. And it, Turns out that was the same time that the conspirators all met a hundred years ago, Karen, right? Y yes. They're putting the story together now. And then he's getting more and more ramped up. And and he's in the foreground of this shot. He's in a darker spot, right? And Kathy and Sandy are behind and they're in a lighter shot. I, I think it's I think it's cool. I don't remember that, but yeah. 
Maybe it's because John Carpenter said he thought it was cool, too. Oh. <laughs> That's why I remember why I wrote it. The priest is getting more and more ramped up, you know, about this whole thing. And Kathy just kind of brushes all that aside and says, well, are you going to give the benediction tonight? <laughs> yeah. So are you going to you know, say some words? Are you going to pray? Which is just a blessing, a benediction. But he says that Antonio this place Bay is has cursed. a curse on it. <laughs> So I'll take that as a no. Yeah, basically he says no. <laughs> but Kathy says as they're leaving, she's kind of concerned about him and says she's going to call the doctor and ask yeah. him to stop by. She thinks that he's taking it too seriously and she's going to ask the doctor to stop by and he says we are all cursed. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. We appreciate you spending time with us. You know, you can help us grow our audience by following us on social media at Scary Spirits Podcast. Just look for us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And don't forget to tell all your friends to find us too. Now let's get back to the show. Back at KAB. And water begins to form on the Dane sign, Karen. Yeah, on the piece of wood. It drips down. Onto the, the tapes. Yep. From which the I didn't know. Then, I didn't know what they were. And then goes to the tape recorder. I guess she is listening to, right? Yeah, she's got a cassette tape recorder that she's been listening to since she was at the top of the stairs going down to the lighthouse. Those are what the promos are on. And... As the water reaches the tape recorder, the voice changes. Correct, Karen? Yes. And she hears what sounds, I guess it says, something like an albatross around the neck. No, more like a millstone. A plumbing stone, by God. You know what that's a reference to, Karen? No, I couldn't tell what they were saying. Because well, it yeah. the Albatross it... around the neck is a reference to the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Oh, okay. Bye. Someone, yeah, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. It's a poem. I, think I had to read that at and some point. It's also a song by the band. Um, who is it? Oh, yeah, Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> it's about 11 minutes long. It's a pretty long song, but it's good. Do they just sing the poem or is it different? It's different. There are spoken words. There is spoken word in the song where they are reciting the poem. You know, like four times 50 men, and, you know, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink, <laughs> you know, water, water everywhere and how the boards did shrink. You know, Karen, you read it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> but it starts to slow down and talk in like a very blue, mm, okay. like that. So I could I heard the albatross thing, but I didn't hear the rest of it. So she sees she notices. Right. Yes. And she looks over and then the engraving changes to six must die instead of doesn't say Dane anymore. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, yeah, it does. That's an important <laughs> point <laughs> that is. I missed. Okay. And then the last words on the tape are damn them all. And then it catches fire. Yes. <laughs> and she puts it out with a fire, fire extinguisher. extinguisher. And the yeah. word is back to Dane engraved uh, in it. I didn't see the difference. I must have been looking at down yeah. or something oh that's yep. a big thing to miss yeah six must die cut back to elizabeth and nick on a the boat they hired to go out to find the seagrass and they're bringing the body back and nick talks about how you know he drowned but he was dry his clothes were dry everything was dry but he had water in his lungs right yes he yes. drowned doesn't make any sense cut to stevie's house where Mrs. Yes. Kobritz is watching Andy. So the babysitter is watching the kid. Stevie calls. She's getting worried. Tells Andy to stay off the rocks and don't pick anything else up. <laughs> yeah, he tells her again. First, it was a gold coin, and then it turned into wood. And she said, stay away. Don't pick anything else up. And then he ju she just says, promise not to leave the house. Like yeah. she starts with don't pick anything up. And then she just goes to, you know what? Just don't freaking leave the house. Just stay in the house. He does the old, oh, mom. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, I love you. And 
He says, yeah, me too. (laughs) (laughs) And he looks out the window longingly at the beach. Yeah, Stevie begins broadcasting. Um, She's going to play some tunes to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Antonio Bay. I did notice, I don't know, he does, the kid asks the babysitter what the clouds are out there. But did I don't know if you noticed when they, when she, he's on the phone, it's bright out. Like it's like mm-hmm. noon. And then it he says, to, soon. he goes to the, he says to the babysitter, what are those clouds out there? And they yep. look out the window and it's pitch black <laughs> except yep. for the cloud. Clouds so are rolling in. It, it was a little jarring how obvious it went from light to dark. Then we cut to the autopsy. The autopsy? Yeah. Where Dr. Fives is examining the body, Karen. Did you know his name was Dr. Fives? No. I just noticed he was dressed exactly like Nick. Yeah. Plaid shirt and jeans. I don't even think he had a coat or lab coat or an apron on. Yeah, but the name Dr. Fives is, you know, uh, in honor of the Vincent Price movie where he plays Dr. Fives. Oh, so there are Easter eggs in this. There are. There are lots of them. Okay. (laughs) Well, I noticed that you've been bringing some up, but I didn't realize how many. (laughs) Yeah. And he's examining the body. Body appears to have been underwater for at least a month, he says. Yeah. There's his wounds are covered in algae and there's silt under his fingernails. Yeah. And they leave Elizabeth alone with the body. Nick and Dr. Fibes go out in the hallway and chat. Yeah. Well, I don't know why they couldn't chat in front of elizabeth but whatever corpse begins to move from under the sheet karen it grabs a scalpel from the table and gets up yeah uh, she doesn't hear anything he knocks something over first of all when he gets up and he's walking and you can hear his footsteps but she doesn't turn her she does turn away from the body while she's in the room but never well she is moving at the same time he is moving as well She's sitting on the desk. She is moving. She is like fidgeting around at the same time the body is moving. Mr. Carpenter made a note of that in the commentary. <laughs> oh, well, I didn't notice that. I thought she would have heard him for sure. But don't stay in a room alone with the corpse. If your friend goes out in the hall to talk to the doctor, go out in the hall to talk to the doctor too. Don't stay alone. But I didn't think she fidgeted enough to cover his <laughs> noise, but okay. But the body falls, and Nick and Dr. Fibes come in. He almost gets to her, the body does, but he just falls over. And apparently he has carved a number three into the floor. Okay, I didn't know if it was a three, three. mountains, or boobs. (laughs) But since I missed the part where six must die, this makes a lot more sense. Because I'm like, why did he... I thought it was a number three, but I wasn't sure. So why did he just fall over? Don't know. And was he was almost like he disappeared. Where you couldn't see the body anymore. Don't know. Then we have a montage of fog, Aaron. Yes, we do. <laughs> Filmed by Deborah Hill with the second unit, apparently. And the fog horn <laughs> blaring. And they're also showing the progression of day to night while this is going on. Yes. So celebration begins, Karen, the 100th anniversary, the centennial, the centurion, whatever you said it was <laughs> in your synopsis. And the mayor is speaking. He does say that, you know, tragedy was a catalyst that brought people together 100 years ago to form the town, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it was a tragedy for those on the ship, but brought the town together. We cut to a bar. The sheriff's talking to Kathy. I guess got about her husband and yeah al who they're all looking for basically said they're, ju- they're just going to keep looking for him and nothing they can do coast guard's going to keep looking they say she should go home but she's not going to go home she's going to give her speech because she's tough do you see the cigarette machine in the background of the bar i did karen those were very handy they back used in to 1980 be. they used to be everywhere <laughs> oh i'm sure for kit right yeah, no one asked you for your ID. You just bought you just the pack. Took your quarters. <laughs> well, first you'd find your pop bottles. Right. First, I mean, Collect first things first. Yeah. Then you'd take your coins to the pizza place, a couple stores down on the strip mall <laughs> that had the cigarette machine. You know, because you couldn't buy your cigarettes at the pony keg at the United Dairy Farmer, Karen, where you turned in your your 
pop bottles because they'd ask you for your ID. So you had to go a couple stores down to the pizza store that had a cigarette machine. You know what I'm talking about, Karen? I've heard that. <laughs> so in the bar, they're listening to KAB radio, and Stevie says the seagrass was found earlier and no more information is available, right? Yes. So Nick calls Stevie on the payphone, Karen. And Stevie tells Nick that she saw fog glowing and moving west. And she tells Nick about the Dane driftwood that her son found. Next, Dan, the weatherman, calls Stevie again. He's tracking the fog, even though he can't. (laughs) Fog's moving in. So Nick says he's going to Spivey Point. Right? He asks Elizabeth to join him, and she does, and... She sets her Budweiser on the bar, and then she decides, no, I'm taking it with me. Right, so she takes the bottle. It with her. <laughs> she took the bottle with her, yeah. So Dan, and talking to Stevie, tells her about the fog, and then Stevie gets on the air and gives a weather bulletin all about the fog. Says she sees fog off the coast, and as she's talking to Dan, fog is creeping in on Dan's window in the background, Karen. It begins to illuminate. Stevie says there's something different about the fog. And Dan kind of says, you on drugs? Like, do you take something to stay awake? Or he kind of makes fun of her. But then... Dan says he's going to go check it out. Because he sees the light in the fog. And he thinks someone's playing a trick on him or something. And there's a knock at the door. Well, the lights go out at the weather station. And all he tells her all the gauges are going crazy and the temperature's dropping. And then he says, some asshole's shining a light through the window. He's going to go check it out. And then there's a pounding at the door. And Stevie tells him to stay away from the door. Don't go to the door. But Dan doesn't listen. Nope. (laughs) He opens the door and he gets hooked in the neck. He go. Stevie hears this all on the phone. She hangs up the phone as the fog rolls in, I wrote. Yeah, she hangs up. She's watching the fog. And I said... I would immediately be trying to get to my kid at this point. That's what I, I made a note when I she's watching the fog roll in. I was thinking I would be leaving because what you just heard on the phone, there's fog surrounding the building. Something horrible happened. I would have been leaving my place of employment right now and going to my kid. Got but to we, Kathy yeah. <laughs> at the centennial celebration, giving a speech. About the people who built the town a hundred years ago. As she's speaking, Stevie gets on the air and says, an urgent message for the sheriff to call me at at her number. Blah, 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 blah. Someone comes up to the celebration there and tells the sheriff, hey, I want you to call the radio station. So he goes back to the bar, the sheriff does, and calls from the payphone in the bar. But as he's... Sorry. As he's talking to Stevie, the fog rolls in and the phone lines spark and the phone goes dead. Back at the celebration, the townspeople all begin to light candles. <laughs> and yes, they're, they're going to have, they talked about it earlier. There's going to be a candlelight procession and they're unveiling a piece of art in the center of a town. A statue. A statue of, I think, the boat. Maybe that went down. I don't know. But that's the whole point. They're doing this celebration. Then they're going, because Kathy is asking her assistant, did you get the candles? And the (laughs) assistant's like, it's done. Everything's done. So this is now, they're all lighting these candles. You know, the skinny ones that have the little cardboard at the bottom so you don't get burned. And they're walking towards the statue that they're unveiling. Then we cut to the fog entering a power plant, it appears. The fog enters a generator, it sparks, and the lights go out in the town. And I write, good thing they had just lit candles. <laughs> yep. So all the electricity is out now. Yep. Stevie goes down to the bottom of the lighthouse and begins to try to start a generator so she can continue broadcasting, Karen. Go back to her house where Mrs. Kobritz is babysitting Andy. And he's concerned that the lights are out. Fog is rolling in. But she says, don't worry. They take care of these things right away. And he says he thinks it's neat. Stevie gets back on air and gets on there and warns Andy and Mrs. Kobritz to get out of the house. She curses the generator, but it does finally start. 
And she pleads for anyone listening to go to her house. She gives her home address to get her son. She says he is trapped in the house. Someone get him. Yeah, she's screaming basically into the. And she does say she has to stay there. She addresses Andy and says, Andy, I have to stay here, but get out of the house. And run. (laughs) Next, we see the fog entering Stevie's house again with Mrs. Kobritz. She sends Andy to his room. Yes, and they have the typical argument. I don't want to go to my room. Go to your room. I don't want to go to my room. (laughs) Can I just stay for two seconds? (laughs) Two more seconds. Just two seconds. She says no. Andy goes upstairs and... I don't think it's upstairs. I think it's just on that same floor. He goes in the room. Yeah, and shuts the door. Makes more sense in a minute. It does. And then as she is standing there with her back to the door, sailors grab her from behind and she... oh. But she opened the door. She did. Which I wouldn't do that. Unless that I knew who was outside my door, I would not open my door in that situation. I don't get that. I'm always locking my doors and putting curtains up and, you know, I don't let anyone in the house. <laughs> I wouldn't open the door. What if it's a vampire? Don't open the door. But yeah, she gets it. Got to Nick and Elizabeth. They hear Stevie on the radio. In their truck heading to Stevie's house. Yeah, because they hear her pleading for someone to go get her kid. We didn't talk about Nick's truck, Karen, but any idea what kind of truck that is? It's an older one. It is, Karen. From the 50s? Close. It's a 1948 F-Series truck. I'm going to guess it's an F1 because that was the one with the... It's probably the cheapest with the least amount of payload. They had an F1, F2, and F3. The only difference was the frame, I guess, because the more it could handle, the more it could haul. 1948 Ford truck. Any idea what that went for, brand new, Karen, way, way back in 1948? $475. No, you're way low, Karen. Okay. $1,239. Ah, $1,200, I said. Yeah, $1,239. What do you think it would cost today, Karen? And I'll give you a hint. It is the highest valued vehicle we have talked about this evening. It is even more than the VW Type 181. In mint condition? Well, Jono, you give me a number and I'll tell you where you're at, I guess. Unless you want to call it first. You want to call it first? No, 40,000. Average retail, 32,100. Oh. That's not too bad. Oh, in mint condition, $69,700. Oh, that was bad. I ruined my good <laughs> guessing up until that point. So back at the house, fog is beginning to enter Andy's room. And the sailors break in. Through the, through the door, door. With their hooks, basically. Yeah. Nick breaks the window in Andy's room and grabs him. And they take him away back to the truck. But, Karen, the truck is, as John Carpenter said, the old stuck-in-the-mud trick. (laughs) Yep, it was stuck in the mud. And And also, Elizabeth doesn't know how to drive it. That's another thing he says. Apparently, she's grinding the gears and she can't. (laughs) And at some point, because the sailors are coming at them, wouldn't you push her out of the way? (laughs) You know? Yeah, sailors surround the vehicle, but eventually Elizabeth gets the truck unstuck and they back away. Is it stuck or can she not get it in reverse? And she finally does because she's grinding the gears badly. And then she finally does get it in reverse and they back away from the sailors. Go back to the celebration. And people were all looking at the statue by candlelight. Sheriff wants to call it a night. And Sandy offers to drive Kathy home. Cut back to the lighthouse. Stevie is talking to Andy over the radio and giving updates on the fog. Yeah, she's telling people where to go. Telling them where the fog is currently and, you know, where to go to avoid it and whatnot. But everyone in town is at the celebration. And if the fog went into town and went to the celebration, it seems like they could have finished off their six in record time. Well, could they, Karen? 
that's not what happens because Stevie tells everyone the only safe place to go is the church. Yep. Stevie tells everyone to go to the church as Nick, Elizabeth, and Indy arrive to town. The fog kind of chases them out of the town. Yeah, but I'm saying, so the, the fog is in town. All the people are in town with no lights, no electricity, and, you know, well, they can't hear the radio, I guess, unless they have a battery. But she's saying, go to the church. Well, the only people that go to the church are the stars. Yes. The whole the whole town yes. is out and vulnerable yes. at a at a statue unveiling. Yes. Okay. So Nick, Elizabeth, Andy, Kathy, and Sandy arrive at the church where Father Malone has been there and has never left. <laughs> he's still, well, he's getting drunk, right? Isn't he? Fog approaches the church. They all go in and uh, Nick takes the father's whiskey bottle, it looks like to me, and breaks it on the pew. Oh, I thought it was wine, but. Uh, it might have been Mad Dog. <laughs> it wasn't in a wine bottle. It was in a more bottle like Mad Dog 2020 or something. Breaks it on a pew where the journal was sitting. And they're frantically asking the priest, is there a basement or somewhere we can go where we can hide? And the priest is all Debbie Downer. Won't do any good. <laughs> they're going to find us. Kathy takes him to the study. Stevie continues to give updates on the fog. And here, the fog creeps down the steps to the lighthouse. Yes. And I wrote, that's a very nice shot. Back at the church, they're barricading themselves in the study. Is that what you said? Yeah, the priest is saying it's judgment day. Blake and those men are coming for us. And then Kathy was almost, it almost is like she smacks him. It's like, get a hold of yourself. But where's the journal? Where's the journal? It's not going to help, he says. But Nick goes out into the church and gets the journal. Go back to the lighthouse and the fog enters. It's coming under the door, close to the generator. And Stevie, of course, goes down there. And then it's cut back to the church where they're reading the, the journal. journal. And they see that six must die. Somehow they figure that shit out. Yeah, I don't know how they know <laughs> that. But but they say, okay, there was three on the seagrass. The weatherman was four and Mrs. Kobritz was five. And the father thinks it is him that they want. They need one they want, more, yeah. They're looking, he thinks they're looking for descendants of the six original conspirators. That would make sense. Although, what a bummer to be punished for the sins of your ancestors. I have something in quotes here that says, I am the thief and God's temple is the tomb that holds the gold. That's what's in the journal. So they realize that the money that they stole is hidden in the church. They didn't use it to build the church. He hid they it did. in the church. Well, yeah, he took some money and built the church and he says... The treasure is there minus the money used to build the church. But they did build the church. So sailors begin breaking through the stained glass windows with their arms. Yes. And then we go back to the lighthouse and the fog's coming in. And Stevie has to block the door with a ladder, but it doesn't work very well. And then to the church where they're breaking the windows. And Kathy and the father are looking for the gold. Yes, and they... Basically Hidden behind the wall where the book pry was. down the yeah pry down the stones where the book was. Got back to the lighthouse and the sailors begin entering to get Stevie. And she runs up. She runs upstairs. Back at the church, they find the gold cross from behind the wall, and the father kind of sneaks out of the study into the sanctuary. Yeah, it's very heavy. That he obviously melted down the gold and made a big fat cross. Yeah, and even and John Carpenter said that Hal Holbrook did a very good job of making that look heavy because it was he not, did oh really <laughs> it, it was did. very light he said he did a great job of that and I read online that one man probably couldn't carry that if it was solid gold it was so heavy it would be so heavy but that would make sense but then I have we cut back to the radio station more fog shit <laughs> i guess the, okay so the cross we should say the cross is very large it's probably waist up as big as the priest right yeah. so it's a very large cross probably that he's like made a yard high like 30 yeah yeah three feet high by a couple feet wide 
Yeah, so it's big. Back at the lighthouse, Stevie climbs onto the roof. She's struggling, as you would. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell she's going to do up there. Seems like a more vulnerable position to me. But And she's making a shit ton of noise because it's a tin roof. So they're going to know where she is. And then we cut back to the church where the, the priest sanctuary. Says, yep. Yeah. And the sailors are in the fall. Here's your gold, Blake. And My grandfather stole it. I'm right. the one who must answer. And Blake does step forward with glowing red, red eyes yep. and draws his sword. We come back to KAB, the lighthouse. Stevie on the roof, I wrote. She's hanging on for dear life. Go back to the church. I'm Father Malone, the sixth conspirator. Cut back That's to the right. lighthouse. Yep. <laughs> Sailors going after Stevie. Stevie fights with them. She does, does she get, get one stabbed. Of their hooks or something. Yeah, she gets hooked. But she then, pulls it out and starts using it to fight, which was. And then we see who John Carpenter calls Worm Face. <laughs> In his commentary, she hits one of the sailors attacking him and his his head turns and we see worms coming out. That's you know, pretty much the only face of the sailors we see. It is. Got back to the church. And the cross glows as Father Malone gives it to Blake. I thought it was getting hot. I didn't know what yeah. was happening there. Yeah, but... It appears the father is electrocuted or, or fr something from the heat or something. And you can't let go, you know. Right. And he's shaking, but Nick jumps in and pulls him back. Then the cross glows even brighter, and the sailors disappear with the cross, and the fog begins to fade away. I was like, did they just want the gold? What good does gold do ghost sailors? I was confused at this point. Vengeance. Vengeful ghosts, Karen. Vengeful ghosts <laughs> take gold? Apparently. Nobody was using the gold anyway. It's not like... Somebody now is going to be poor, or it, it didn't make any sense at that point. But the fog is receding, and Stevie seems to be okay. Everyone runs out of the church, and Nick lights a Marlboro as the fog fades away. Next, cut back to the lighthouse, and Stevie gives a soliloquy. Karen, ending with warning sailors to look for the fog. Well, she also says... Something came out of the fog to try to destroy us, and then it vanished. It could come again to the ships at sea. Well, basically, she says it can come again. So I was like, sequel? <laughs> <laughs> she just set up a sequel. Back at the church, Father enters the sanctuary and by himself and says to himself, why not six? Yeah, I thought he was going to kill himself, you know, to make it the six. But the fog enters under the door, Karen. Sailors are back in the sanctuary. Blake swings his sword and decapitates Father Malone. Credits. The end. All right, Karen. Anything you really enjoyed in this film? Any do favorite wanna, scenes? Do you want to go first since it's one of your favorites? I do enjoy this film in general. It's one of my faves. Because I would like to know why it's one of your faves. I like John Carpenter in general. I I love... you like what his directing style. His what what about yeah. you know? Yeah yeah yeah. Well, it's a lot of back and forth. <laughs> a lot, which I don't think would be so much of an issue if you weren't trying to write down what was going on. You know what I mean? I think that yeah. makes it harder when you're doing something like this. Whereas if you're just watching it. I don't know if I would have even noticed it as much. I'm sure I would have noticed it, but not as much. But I just am curious as to why this is one of your favorites. I do love a good vengeful ghost story. Mm -hmm. uh, I I like that we don't see much of the sailors or the ghosts. They're all silhouetted. You know, we. I really did eyes. like that. Yeah, I really like that too. The lighting on them. They were so creepy. I guess that's why I like junk. He leaves a lot to the imagination, right? Yeah. Well, I guess. Yeah. And he calls this a low budget film during the commentary. And it probably was. It, I mean, it was his second major film. He did this right after Halloween.
But even when they were silhouetted, you could see that they were gnarly. There was enough fishermen there that... and gnarly and the hooks. You could see the weapons. You could almost see like the dripping clothes. Like they really looked menacing and you never even saw them. Yes. Which I I agree with you. I would 100%. have liked to I would have liked to have been seen more of them that way. Not necessarily seeing more of them like in detail. But like um I think I told you I even looked at like a Roger Ebert review from, you know, Cisco and Ebert at the movies or whatever. And they neither one of them liked it. So at the time it wasn't very critically acclaimed. It was it was kind of like, well, okay, it's fog. Who would nobody's scared of fog? You know what I mean? They wanted more of the the ghosts, I guess. And I, well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be fog. upset with more of the ghost either, but I thought he made the fog a character. It, it builds. You know, right? I thought the way it surrounded the lighthouse and it, it's like a precursor. You know, you know something's coming. It's like the music in Jaws, right? Yes. When you hear that, but when you see this fog, you know it's coming. So I thought it I I didn't mind that. No. I mean it builds. It's kind of a I mean it's not really slow, I guess. It's slow. <laughs> I don't well the beginning is. is very slow. I thought I was okay. I was struggling a little bit. I was like, "Is this is something going to happen?" Like, what? <laughs> when? And then it well, he's in. trying to give you background on the town, and I get it, and the people, and the predicament they might be facing <laughs> later. I know, but it just it was slow for me in the beginning. That's one thing I didn't like about it. It seemed to drag. And some things just seemed random. I don't know. Fluff almost. As I noted when we we're going through it, there are a few nice shots I really liked. You did mention those, yes. I thought the acting was good. I yeah, Stevie I like walking the down the steps to the lighthouse. I mean it's a tiny lighthouse, and they even said it's a tiny tiny lighthouse, but scene you didn't say how many steps her, there were. There's, there's like three hundred and something. Some, yeah. yeah, I remember it. <laughs> Lots of use of shadow and light I liked in the shots, which I think is probably another Carpenter thing. I did. I will say I liked the story. I thought it was creative and, I mean, a leper colony. <laughs> yeah, they came up with the story when they were they were visiting Stonehenge and it was a foggy day. Well, they came up with the fog part, but just the moving the colony and people not wanting them close and then them orchestrating the basic murders of the people. I thought that was all really good. I liked the story. I agree. What did you think of the? Well, of course, I didn't hear it, but the soundtrack. I've heard it before, but not recently. I didn't notice it. Okay. Because it was all done by John Carpenter as well, so. You mean I mean I noticed the jazz music and I noticed the well, that classical was, that, music, but that was like real jazz music. And the reason they use jazz music is because it was cheap to get the rights. Oh well, there you go. But, <laughs> but other than that, I didn't notice the soundtrack. And actually, uh, Adrian Barbeau, who played Stevie, and John Carpenter were married at the time of this film. Oh, she was good. She had a good radio voice anyway. I don't know if that's her normal voice, but it's not she they patterned it after some someone some famous radio. I don't know who oh. off the top of my head, but yeah, she was trying to copy someone. Anything else you really liked? No, no, I think that's a lot of stuff we liked. All right. Anything you didn't like, Karen? Well, like I said, I found it slow. For the first half of it, I thought it dragged. There was important information in all of it, and I understand that. But for some reason, it just didn't seem to move forward much. I will say it's a little disjointed. And I think he basically wrote a part for Jamie Lee Curtis. She wasn't originally in this film. Right? She, he wrote a part for her to be in it because she was... After she had done Halloween, she wasn't getting any other movie roles. She was getting commercials and all that crap. And so he wrote her a part for this film, right? This is well, her she's second not film after Halloween. She's not necessary. And plus, it's cool that she's in a couple 
scenes there at the end with her mom. Yeah, I'm sure that's well, of course, obviously, that's the first time she'd ever done that. Yeah, I'm sure that was cool for them. But she does seem kind of peripheral, like she's not really needed in the story at all. And, you know, Nick does save the kid. So he has, I don't know, it just seemed. But while this was in post-production, she did prom night and terror train. So she had Halloween, prom night, terror train, the fog, like kind of made her a career. You know what I mean? Made her the. The, the new scream queen. <laughs> I like her. I mean, I she's fine in it. It is disjointed. It's a lot of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And sometimes very quick without much information. She's climbing up the stairs at the lighthouse back to the church. You know? But like <laughs> you said, as I'm watching it, that doesn't bother me. But if I'm trying to Write down right. what's happening. It does bother me. It really makes you <laughs> understand that it's happening happening simultaneously. You know, yeah. she's climbing up. I mean, it's important to know these things are happening at the same time. So when the cross lights up and the fog is dissipating, it's happening at the same thing to her. So you see it. He can't split screens, but he's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So yeah. It is disjointed if you're trying to write down because it's like, I think I even missed some of them. I did notice that um, Adrian and Jamie Lee and even uh, Janet were never on screen together. They weren't. No, they didn't even. Need, I was noticing Adrian's like, pretty much not with anyone. She's by herself except for with her son and that one with scene. her kid. Yeah. So she could have filmed. I just noticed she could have filmed almost completely separately. Yeah. Than the rest of the movie. And Hal Holbrook, he the only time we see him is in the church because it was too expensive to take him to locations. Oh, because he was famous? Yeah. So they just kept him at the church, which was a set. Right? So mm -hmm. he was never at that church, quote unquote, right? He was always at the set, the sound stage where they built the church inside a sound stage it's just it, kind of interesting they could have filmed the whole movie and then put adrian's parts in later <laughs> like whenever she, she didn't have to even do it at the same time as anyone else except for that one scene with her son and there, there were they did film this and then went back and reshot a bunch of stuff and added a bunch of stuff so that they talk about it in the commentary. They basically made the film twice because they added and edited so much because when they first, after they first shot it and watched it, it wasn't scary enough. So mm -hmm. the, that first scene with John Houseman was added afterwards. A lot oh, of the story. The end, yep. A lot of scenes at the end with Adrian Barbeau on the roof of the lighthouse and all that shit filmed afterwards. That's no. actually Deborah Hill. Like when you see her, her, just her hands or just her feet, that's actually Deborah Hill. <laughs> hands and feet. So interesting. But it works. I think I like it. Anything else you hated about it, Karen? No. <laughs> okay. You can speak freely. No, I liked it. All right, Karen. I just what? wasn't, I, I don't think I'm as impressed with it as you are. And that's why I was wondering <laughs> am I missing something or, you know, I really did like the story. I think it's a very cool concept. What kind of cocktail rating you want to give it? I'd give it a three. Okay. But, you know, if you want to argue up, that's I'm okay. fine. I'm okay with a three. I know. I think of... it's an upper three. I don't, but I don't think it's as good as some of the two, the twos that we've given. Well, I just, it's not, it's not as good as Halloween. I know that. I'd almost be interested in seeing a remake. Just to see if they if they ruined it or if they made it better. Well, there is a remake, Karen. You can. Watch. I know, but I was just I saw, but you know, with special effects and stuff, would that really make a difference, or did he? And I think he got a like a producer credit or something on the remake. Even I'm just curious if a, with he did a lot with a little in this movie with lighting. Yeah, but but I mean, he didn't like he said it was a low. He calls it a low budget. Its budget was one point one million, and it made twenty one million. So it did all right. Sure, the studio would take that. 
Yeah. And lots of the, I'll say this, like we were talking about Easter eggs earlier, lots of the character names and lots of the street names that Stevie like mentions when she's warning people about the fog or people in places from uh, John Carpenter's childhood in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Wouldn't that be awesome if some kid that you grew up with and were great friends with <laughs> started making movies and then all of a sudden there you are. Well, Greg Wallace, Greg's been missing all night. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, get away from Buckwheat Road. <laughs> you know, like it would be stuff from Buckwheat your childhood. <laughs> Go down to the old pony keg. Yeah, I guess you'd have to use Buckwheat, wouldn't you? Buckwheat. That's well, yeah. The hell of a street name. <laughs> Everybody knows Buckwheat Road. I don't know. Yeah. It'd just be kind of cool if that was happening. True. So, as we said, there is a 2005 remake. I'm just curious with know, maybe advanced we'll, maybe special we'll effects. It. I don't know. Would it be better or worse? We don't watch a lot well, of remakes. It didn't get good ratings. and I bet they did a lot less with a lot more money. I've seen people say it's interesting that the remake is a PG-13 and this one is R. And they even say, like, doesn't seem. Well, there's no blood. Much different. Did you notice that? <laughs> right. I mean, when he gets his head chopped off, you don't see the head roll. There's you don't suggested see... violence, you know? It's a... Yeah. I mean, you see a sword come through a guy. Well, on the eyeball thing, that that probably got to you because you don't like eyeballs. But you stuff. don't see it. I guess you don't. The shot from his back of his head. You would, I wouldn't even know he was stabbing his eyeballs if he didn't do it twice, very deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I guess you're right. No. Well, All times right. change. What was... What was R in one era is going to change over time. I mean, this could almost be on TV. Cable for sure. All right. Three cocktails. I can live with that. What did we learn today, Karen? We learned about fog. What's the foggiest place in California? Point Point Reyes. Point Reyes. Reyes. We learned about trawlers. We learned why our ship's female. You had some Iron Maiden. I had one. <laughs> one, okay. You had some lots of tidbits that you could put out. About the vehicles. Oh, yeah, the vehicles. Well, I was doing good, and then I got that last one was really took me down. I like those old trucks, too. Right. What do you think of your uh, Black Fog cocktail? Black Fog. Um, It's good. Once again, mine has evaporated. I didn't I didn't really taste so much raspberry, even though I put a little more in. I would I, put a lot more in. I'd put like a shot in or something. Yeah. I, I put a little more in more in mine and I could taste it. But I like this I like the dark beers. Not a lot, because I don't really like beer, but of all the beers, I find those the most tolerable. All right, next film. What do you got? It's your choice. It is my choice, Karen. <laughs> You're laughing that it's not a good sign. <laughs> well, apparently, Karen, we're going to do two John Carpenter films in a row. Is it The Thing? What is it? It is not. It no. is called In the Mouth of Madness. Okay. What year was that made? That is from 1995, Karen. Why did you choose this movie? This film was released... February 3rd, 1995. It was released between this episode and our next one. <laughs> Excellent. And what are we going to be drinking? We're going to be having the Hobbs and Highball. Okay. It is a cocktail inspired by this film. Oh, okay. I found. We're going to need two ounces of gin. Dry gin, if it matters. <laughs> <laughs> One and a half ounces of blue curacao. Okay. Three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice from the plastic lemon and club soda. All and right. Combine all the ingredients in a mixing glass with ice and stir. I was going to say, you don't shake if it's club soda. No, well, you don't add the club soda yet. Oh, So okay. you add the gin, blue curacao, and lemon juice in a mixing glass and stir. 
Strain into a highball glass filled with fresh ice, Karen. Fresh ice. <laughs> Excellent. And then top with club soda and serve. The Hobbs and Highball. Found that recipe on two geeks who eat.com. <laughs> mm, that sounds like a fun one. <laughs> I know. I'm sounds gonna, like they drink. Have to go too. back there quite a bit. They don't just eat, they drink. Much of the movie takes place in a town called Hobbs End. Not only is it a John Carpenter film, it stars one of my favorite actors, Sam Neill. Okay. So there you go. Have you seen it before? I have not. Okay. Like I said, it's been on my list for a while. Well, have... we're knocking off the list. We're getting... That's right. In the mouth of madness. Anyone you need to thank this week, Karen? Well, I'd like to thank our listeners that you mentioned at the our beginning. Our friends of... and listeners. <laughs> yes, that you mentioned at the beginning. There's a lot of podcasts out there. Thank you for spending time with us. And who would you like to thank? Karen, I need to once again thank the band Verse 13 for providing all the music in the Scary Spirits podcast. The music definitely makes the podcast better. Anything else, Karen? Please drink responsibly. Yes. Thanks for listening to the Scary Spirits podcast, where the movies might be iffy, but the drinks are always solid. We would love to hear from you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Scary Spirits Podcast. Or go to our website, scaryspirits.com. And if you want the direct line, email us at info at scaryspirits.com. If you really want to help us out, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And remember, always drink responsibly. See you next week. Thank you.